Good evening to everyone. My name is Tekan Kwaju, and I'm going to be the host of today's program organized by the Global Youth Network Platform for Education and Empowerment. And today we're going to have a very interesting guest. And she'll be talking about something very interesting. And the topic of today is urban violence and city transformation. And our guest today is Marina Dukul Diaz. If I didn't pronounce your name correctly, please do well to do the rightful pronunciation. Before she comes on board, let me have the opportunity to do a short biography of her and the rest is going to be painted by her. Marina is from Colombia. She's a political scientist, a researcher, and a media analyst. She is currently doing a master's degree program in the domain of international security, and her special focus is on diplomacy, global risk at Sciences Po, that's in Paris, France. She's equally a global fellow working for Heartland Alliance International, an NGO which is based in Iraq. You have the floor. Welcome once more. Thank you so much, Tekang, for this kind invitation. I'm pretty glad to be here sharing some ideas with you. As you said, my name is Mariana Duque Diez, and I'm from Colombia in South America. I would like to talk with you about human violence and city transformation, doing special emphasis in the case of the city where I come from. Okay. So if that's fine for you, I will share a presentation and we can start talking about the topic. Definitely. So let me try to make you a host and so you could definitely try to share your work. Thanks very much. You have the floor now. You are the host. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, wait, it says I cannot share my screen yet. You can share screen. I made you a host so you can do that. One more time. Okay, okay you're host yeah. now. Yeah. You can try. Great. You all see my my screen now? Yeah, sure. It's visible. I think everyone can see. Great. That's great. So uh, if you're fine with this, I will first talk about the the case that I want to introduce you. And then in the end we can share some ideas, ask some questions. But definitely, if there is something like uh, that has to be discussed right in the moment, please uh, raise your hand in the Zoom platform and I'll be very happy to give you the floor. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. And please, you have 25 minutes for the presentation. And equally, um, at the end of your presentation, we're going to give you five minutes for you to try to talk to us about your organization, which you run, because I happen to have met you in Istanbul during the Jesus Ended Global Peace Conference in Istanbul and also the Q&A session will be after you have done kind of a resume of your organization. So you have the floor, 25 minutes. Great. So I'll, today I'll talk about German violence and city transformation, as I said. And well, first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for my English because it's not my first language, native language. So if there's some things that are not completely clear, please let me know uh, so we can have like a worth uh, the uh, discussion um uh, well why i want to talk about urban security knowing that there are a lot of problems about violence conflicts and so on uh, well first uh, and knowing that also the un uh, sdgs make a big emphasis on this situation which are urban spaces uh, meaning, for example, in the 11th goal, which is sustainable cities and communities, and in the 16th goal, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, this is important uh, to say because it's like kind of a justification of, of about why it's important to talk especially about urban security, the challenges, and how can we transform cities in this uh, case. Uh, so why? Why it matters? Uh, the answer is because today we live in a urban world, right? Uh, nowadays, more than 50% of urban er uh, there are more than 50% of urban areas worldwide, meaning that uh, every day people is moving more and more to big cities. But moreover, three billion people will be added to urban populations worldwide between 2010 and 2050, according to UN evidence 
which means that uh, if before we used to live in rural areas, very spread, um, nowadays we are all trying to get together in big urban places, meaning better opportunities, but also bigger challenges uh, in that in the sense. Um, also, it's important to say that uh, more than or around the 80% of the global GDP comes from urban from the cities, from urban areas. Uh, and why? Why people is moving to urban areas? This is because especially uh, urban areas represent centers of exchange of ideas. It means places uh, where you can satisfy uh, your needs easier than in rural areas. So people start to move to cities because they look for better opportunities because they want to access easier to services such as health, such as education, um, also to, to services and goods easier than in rural areas. And this process started in... in we can say around 30, uh, 300 years ago when the industrialization process started, right? So if we do a balance, we can say urban areas are, are pretty desirable because it helps us to exchange ideas, to get all together and to develop us uh, ourselves in a better way than just rural areas. Uh, because especially because cities are uh, places where there is a big wealth accumulation, you know, uh, and th that means that a lot of people would like to move from uh, rural areas to urban areas. But the thing is that sometimes when there is, especially when there is a lack of uh, state presence and there are like a weak satisfaction of human rights, uh, urban areas become uh, in places where there is big inequalities, you know? So even if they are good for like making your life easier, let's say, they also represent places where there can be easier uh, to create, for example, a criminal group. Or there are, place, it's, there are places, cities are places where it's easier to do micro trafficking or even where there is a lot of unemployment. And all these situations, that can be analyzed as causes, but also as consequences, uh, represent, uh, as I said, causes and consequences for urban violence, you know? So if there are not a lot of opportunities, but you can access easier, uh, pretty easy to um, criminal groups, then maybe you will join a criminal group rather than trying to satisfy in a legal way your needs, right? So that's exactly where the threat is found. Uh, it's uh, because of the lack of state presence, uh, big inequalities make easier or, or facilitate the, the appearance of, uh, like, the flourishing of urban violence. Then, uh, here, I would like to do a remark, because if we are trying to say why it's important to do a, a urban transformation or a city transformation, uh, in a context of, uh, of course, a uh, urban violence, uh, we cannot uh, forget that conflict is inherent to human beings. So if we want to create a um, city transformation, we cannot think that there is not going to be conflict. But the difference is that when conflicts are not well dealt, they change their uh, way to to be in violence, you know? And it's when a conflict scales, like there is a conflict escalation. And so there, the use of force uh, and of, of course of violence change the way that people try to solve their, their conflicts. What's the point with urban areas? That it, we cannot talk just about violence, but about violence. Because especially in urban areas, there is a complexity of actors, of causes, and of interests. So as I said, there is like a big group uh, where, where you can find a lot of, not just opportunities for legal activities, but also for illegal activities. So when we talk about urban violence, uh, we are really talking about urban violences, okay? Uh, but it doesn't mean that if you're thinking about urban transformation, uh, we're talking necessarily about a uh, lack of conflict because conflict is always there okay so this was the 
more theoretical part. Now I want to tell you more about the experience that I have from the place I come from. This is the city where I come from. It's a very big valley uh, that today has 88% uh, uh, of urban population, meaning that it's pretty dense. And this city where I come from, it's called Medellin, Medellin, Colombia. I'm pretty sure that you have uh, heard about it, uh, not in the best way, of course, because you have a lot of uh, bad uh, marketing uh, with Sirius and so on. And even here in the, in the city where I live, which is Paris, we receive a lot of publicity uh, talking about my city in a way that it's uh, pretty unfair, I would say. In this case, it's uh, in the metro, st in one of the metro stations here in Paris, and this is in Champs-Élysées. And so usually uh, in the international arena, when people listen about Medellin, uh, know just these kind of things. But as I said, that's pretty, pretty unfair because the story that we have behind this kind of series is it's much more deeper and much more difficult than the simplistic way it is seen in the shows. Why? Because my city, uh, it's immersed in the context of a city that, it's, uh, that has suffered about, uh, that has suffered of conflict. Uh, so in the, in the 70s, uh, we had this big mix of uh, guerrilla groups trying to move from the rural areas to the uh, urban um, areas, such as the population did. And then in the 80s, we had this big mix, mixture of narco-traffic plus organized crime. Then in the 90s, it was a, there was a big lack of state control uh, that made things much more difficult and if, uh, between 1989 and 1991, we used to be called the most violent city in the world. Nowadays, we have a very, very different story to tell. And we experienced a big process of city transformation. So uh, before, uh, but before talking about this transformation, the paradox that we suffered was that even if we, had if we were experiencing a big demographic, economic, and political development, at the same time, because of inequality and because of the lack of a state of presence, the, there was also an increase of criminality, exclusion, and violence. So this uh, phenomena that I call managing paradox works also for urban areas, as I tried to explain before, that even if, there, if uh, urban places are a demographic and political and even idea centers of exchange, if there is not a, a, a state of control and there is not a lot of opportunities uh, or even the guarantee of human rights, the thing is that they uh, change their um, nature and became, pla become places of criminality, exclusion and violence, which was exactly what happened with us between the 70s and the 90s. But as I said before, um, uh, Medellin today has a different story to tell. And that's uh, because we did kind of a, a special process that I would like to show you uh, with two specific examples. Of course, this is pretty simplistic because the process is much more longer than, than just these two examples, but they helped me to prove my point. Uh, and to show you how can we pass from urban violence to the transformation of the city. So the first case that I want to show you, it's this, uh, the Comuna 13 with the, its electric stairs. This is my city. As you can see, it's a big valley uh, with big skyscrapers in one side, but on the other side with a lot of informal settlements, right? Uh, you can see here in the left part that these informal settlements uh, are built in big hills, in, in very high hills. And so it's very difficult for people to access to their places, to their homes. So in the, in the 2000, uh, around 2000, 2002, 2006, I would say, the government tried to reach these places and they built this um, like, creative way to transport people, which were the electric stairs that you can see here. So
So in this place, uh, in the uh, Comuna 13, which translates like the, the 13th district, uh, these electric stairs are the way that people can go up to their, to their houses. Okay, so they are used as, as a transfer as transportation, so people people can access to their homes and also go to the downtown. But the thing is that not just the government went there, right, uh, with this uh, electric stairs, but also the people from the community, from the population, started to appropriate of these spaces. So nowadays. They, it's not just about they, they, the people going up and down the electric stairs to go to their places, but about even tourism or people being like curious about the phenomenal that occurs there. And so right now, the people that live there do creative stuff to attract people uh, and go there. So, for example, in the, in the left part, you can see these guys that are from the Comuna 13 that, does hip -hop, that do hip hop so tourists can go and see the transformation of the place. In the right part, you can see a woman that sells a typical traditional Colombian um, jewelry, jewelry, and uh, the name of her is small market. It's like um, the strong woman from the 13th district, right? Uh, that, that's a very symbolic case because the 13th district Used to, used to be one of the most disputed places in Medellin when we had this big uh, problem with narco-traffic, with organized crime, with guerrilla, and so on. Nowadays, it's not about the illegal actors that make part, uh, that uh, take control of the area, but it's about the population. Because uh, the government went there, make, make, like create a state of control there, but also because the population Feel, felt appropriated of this transformation and so create their own dynamics, right? This is the first uh, example that I wanted to show. And then this is the second one. Uh, what you see in the left part, it's uh, what we used to use as a landfill in Medellin. Uh, in the first half of the 20th century, Medellin was not uh, still urbanized there. So all the waste that we had from the city used to go there. And this big hill, uh, this, uh, this uh, amount of waste created a hill. But then there was a big population that was excluded from the dynamic of the city uh, that found a place to live there. And so they started to create their own settlements just above the waste, right? Which represented a lot of problems, not just about healthy, but about the environment, you know? People used to live exactly above the waste of the rest of the city, which shows a completely like shocking dynamic of uh, exclusion in a, in a city that was growing at the time. Well, the time, uh, like time passed, and people decided not to move from there because they found there a place to live. So the government had to transform or to change the way uh, they saw the place. And they uh, did a big process of transformation of this hill uh, with a lot of um, technical help. So they could create this uh, big hill that, that was waste into a hill that could be available. So nowadays, they they don't have uh, the um, they don't live like just a uh, above the waste, but they have all these public services that they can have uh, in the place, and even they have this communal uh, community center that it's administrated not by the government but by the people that live there. Okay, this community that it's called Moravia are pretty conscious about the environmental issues, and so they are like very important uh, leaders in, uh, in Medellin, my city, to recycle and reuse because they have all this story uh, from uh, the waste of the city, right? Uh, in, the, in the right side, 
side, you can see two girls that live there in Moravia uh, that were taking care of this uh, floor that you see there because they wanted to have it clean, right? So here, what I want to show you, it's that transformations, even if there are, uh, if, even if we uh, think about uh, violence, don't come al uh, along uh, with presence, with state of presence or like um, facing criminality uh, with weapons or even with, with more public force. It has to be a real transformation that comes from the inside and in a dynamic of bottom up, you know, where people, where communities feel involved in this transformation, where they can be part of the dynamic of the city. So we can really, tr uh, we can really talk about a uh, transformation and urban peace. Otherwise, we will have more, uh, let's say, um, cops, or we will have more weapons, like uh, state weapons, but people would not feel safe and they will not be appropriated from their places. So uh, there wouldn't be a, like a real dynamic of a, of a urban area, such as the big uh, metropolis that we know from all around the world. Uh, after saying that, uh, I, wa I want to tell you, also being kind of an ambassador of my city, that Medellin today, it's not just about narcos or these kind of things, but today we're, uh, we're not even that, like uh, today we're part of the Learning Cities Network from UNESCO, we're the resilient city, uh, we're a case study for a lot of uh, urban areas in the world that want to see how, uh, how can they transform their territories to habitable territories. And we're also a center for the fourth industrial revolution and also a UNESCO cultural city. Of course, we have a lot of challenges but, uh, that we are still facing and that we are still trying to deal with. But the big point here is that in a period of 30 years, we are able to talk about this place that used to be called the most violent city in the entire world to a city of transformation, right? Of a more inclusion and more uh, places for people. So if we want to, say, to talk about urban transformation of urban violence and city transformation, what we have to take to have in mind all the time, it's the, this key concept, which is the right to the city. The right to the city, it's a concept that appeared uh, around, in around the 70s, I would say, uh, that aims to promote uh, environments where cities are not, are not just places to uh, receive, uh, no, to produce uh, goods and services, but also to people develop themselves. So when we talk about direct to the city, we're talking about uh, building an environment where it is possible to live with dignity, being recognized as part of the city and to guarantee equitable distribution of resources, such as work, health, education, and also symbolic resources such as memory, political participation, and information access. All this concept, all this big concept about right to the city uh, points to the idea of equality, you know? How can we do uh, places, uh, urban places, where people can have their human uh, rights completely guaranteed, right? Uh, so, saying that, I just want to finish uh, talking about urban violence and city transformation, showing that if we want to think about stopping urban violence, we have to understand cities as vital factors for human rights promotion, and particularly uh, to promote the right to the city. So, if you want to remember three key things about the, what I'm trying to show you and what I showed you about Medellin, which is my city, I would, I would like to say three things. First, that urban transformations take time. Second, that urban, urban transformations need joint, joint efforts, right? It's not just about the state or the government, it's not just about the people, but it's about the both of them, right? working together to create a place or, a, or a, an environment where it is possible to live all together. And third, um, 
which I would say it's the most important one, it's that there won't be urban peace if there is not a right to the city gar guaranteed, okay? So if we want to think about the urban transformation and if we want to create urban peace, we have to take to have in mind all the time the right to the city. That's all. I hope you enjoyed what I said that you understood my point and hopefully that you have a different perspective from for Medellin uh, and for what it means uh, for our community today um, and all the, the process that we experienced. Um, okay, that's uh, the presentation. Uh, briefly, I would like to talk about the organization that I represent. Uh, um, well, today uh, I'm Today I'm living in France, in Paris, uh, but I'm part of a big, the biggest community of political scientists in Latin America, which is called Es de Politologos. Es de Politologos, it's a big platform that uh, creates creative context, con content sorry, uh, to promote political knowledge, inform debate and analysis, and also to create awareness about the, the phenomena that occurred in Latin America. The third point, which is create awareness, it's exactly the one that I'm doing here and that I tried that, the one that I tried to do when I was in Istanbul with uh, our host, uh, that it's like showing which are the problems that we are facing in Latin America and create debates where we can share good ideas uh, good experiences and also bad experiences that can help not only my region but also other regions uh, all around the world. And uh, through this platform, we're aiming to be agents of social and political change in a digital world. So, yeah, that's mainly what I do. That's uh, everything about my my organization. And again, I want to say thank you to Tekang, to the Global Youth Connect platform for this invitation. And yeah, the floor is uh, available for all the questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks very much for that beautiful presentation. I'm sure our guest has taken us through a, a 190 or 180 or 200 degrees across the, the presentation where she comes from particularly. And her topic is kind of very sensitive. And for those who are joining us, uh, the topic we have today is urban violence and city transformation. And our guest is Mariana, uh, which she's from Colombia. So it's a time for the Q&A session. I mean, if you didn't understand anything, feel free to try to post your question to her directly, or you can write it on the chat, uh, on the chat box. So the question and answer session is open. And I'm the moderator. My name is Tekan Kwaju for today's session. So we are waiting for the questions. And I think every, we have a good number of participants joining us uh, across the globe from India, in Turkey, in France, in, in, in Nigeria, in, in Kenya, and equally across other countries. So the Q&A session is on, waiting to get the questions coming. Musinga Kevin, I'm seeing you shaking your head. Do you have one or two questions to pose to our, our guest? Yeah. Um... Good evening, Mr. Twickham. I have some series of questions. Can you get me? Yeah, sure. I can get you clearly. You could proceed to your question. Make it short and straight to the point. Yeah, um, the question I have um, in her presentation, she talked about um, right and dignity as um, a factor in city transformation. And I wish you ask, inequality has always been a major problem in every country when it comes to the aspect of city transformation. So how, so how can we handle such a situation? So how can we, sorry, what? I, I, I lost the last part. How can we handle such a situation, looking into taking into consideration that inequality has always been a major factor when it comes to city transformation. Even though the resources are there, but the resources are not evenly in, in distributed. That is my question. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelvin, for this uh, wonderful question. Uh, a, a big question, actually. 
And yeah, I do agree that the problem about inequality, it's the main point when we're talking about city transformation. What I have to say, it's uh, in two directions. And it's that if we want to uh, face inequality, there has to be first a uh, better and uh, clear and transparent government that plays a big role in the distribution of resources, you know, but also there has to be a big and active uh, social movement, you know. If there's not a, an active population asking for their rights, you know, not, not just asking, but promoting and creating awareness of the needs that they have and also of the, of the rights that they have, of course, there is not going to be a government that answers to that, you know. So it's in both senses. If people ask and they are active to, to make control to their government, the government should be more transparent, more clear in the way they distribute and that they uh, try to solve inequalities. Of course, it, it uh, sounds pretty simple, but it isn't, because there's a lot of interests in between, you know? Uh, there's a lot of interests, there is a lot of uh, actors that have, uh, a, as I said, interests uh, in between. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a process, and uh, as I said, Transformation takes time, but what I see, at least from the from the case of my city, it's that when people feel empowered and ask for their rights, it's easier for it's easier it's a, even mandatory for the government to answer to these inequalities. Okay, do you have the second question, Kevin? If you not, then I can just pose this one on behalf um, from from another person. Um, it's a question and the person is asking, what challenges have you encountered so far in this city quest in transforming your city, which has been kind of plagued or which was dubbed like the city of violence, particularly when it comes to looking at the world from a global perspective? What challenges have you encountered so far in trying to transform these? Well, I would say that uh, pretty close to what we were talking before, the biggest uh, problem or the biggest challenge is about inequality, you know, because especially in a region such as Latin America, the problem, and even I would say even Africa, there is a lot of people from Africa today. The problem is that there is a lot of wealth, there is a lot of money of uh, resources that it's concentrated in few people. And then uh, there is a lot of people that has less than nothing, I would say. Uh, so for me, the biggest challenge is about that, because we all as human uh, beings first uh, deserve uh, our human rights completely guaranteed, but also like we have to guarantee uh, well, our wealth, our health, our needs, you know, our, our basic needs. So we're, uh, places where people are have their needs uh, better solved, I can say that are uh, places that are much more safer. Okay, thanks very much. I think we have got another question from Usman, but before Usman comes, I'll just to say that on Global Youth Connect chat platform, we educate, we empower, and we seek to transform everything from politics, economics, health, agriculture, the environment, and whatever, to a next level, positively. Um, Usman, you have a question, please. You have the floor. Yeah, we can get you. I okay, one minute thirty seconds. Your question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mariana Diaz, for the presentation. My question is those uh, with. In regard to urban development, urban issues, where should we expect more from the local government or from the central government? Thank you. Thank you so much for this question and for being part of this uh, webinar. That's a big question. Mm, it, did, it I I would say it depends a lot of uh, on the administrative uh, sphere of each country, but. From my own perspective, and 
as a student of global risks, I would say that uh, the central governments, like the in, in national in a national perspective, um, states are not being able to solve the problems of people. So if I have to expect more from something or from someone uh, or from some from some institution, I would say that I would expect more from the regional level. There is when we study um, city diplomacy, there is a say uh, that I really agree that it's that while uh, states or nations talk, cities do. So the things that today uh, urban areas, especially like uh, these big cities, uh, if they have the if they have enough power, let's say in administrative terms. To, to face these conflicts, uh, to, to face, not conflicts, but issues, if they, there are, if they have the means to solve the, the more effective than governments, like national governments. But again, it depends on the structure of each country, because there are countries that are pretty centralized and that work fine. The case of Latin America, and especially of Colombia, it's that we are a country big very big that has a lot of difference uh, between the regions so it's easier to understand the phenomena and the situations the issues of each region by the by the regional government rather than the big national government that usually it's pretty let's say slow to answer this kind of, of problems and i would say that the the transformation that my city uh, lived was in a big part thanks to the munip municipal level. The national level, of course, it's important, but I would say that the main role uh, there was about the regional level, not about the, the big one. Okay, uh, there's another question, and the question is, the United Nations is 75 years old. If you have the opportunity to sit with the stake holders of the UN, that's the Secretary General and others. What would be your plea for the UN to do in carrying forward this issue of urban violence and city transformation in conflict areas, like what is happening between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the war in Southern Cameroon, and equally the war with Israel and, and Palestine, Gaza, and many other areas in the world. So what would be your, your proposal? Thank you. Well. That's uh, also a big question, but uh, I guess I, I, I would say the UN, it's a very, very important platform. It's a very important organization and it's a big, uh, like successful, we can say kind of successful model uh, that we have achieved, but it has a lot of problems that we have to face and that we have to tackle. And one of them, it's that they want to solve a lot of problems not being in the territories, you know, not being in the field. So you have, if I have to say something uh, to them to solve this kind of problems, it's that they shouldn't be that comfortable trying to solve things from their offices, but they should be there in Azerbaijan and in Armenia. They should be in Cameroon. They should be in the Israel and Palestine and see what really people uh, live there you know, and understand what means to be part of a conflict, you know, what means to be part of, a, of a, these issues, uh, this lack of human uh, rights guarantee, and uh, what it means to try to deal every day with the lack of resources uh, to satisfy your human needs. So uh, that will be my plea, like uh, they should be there in the field and see before trying to take any kind of decision or trying to solve any kind of thing from their offices. Okay, we got two more questions. But before we, I, I read the questions, I'm going to call on Samuel Jane. Samuel Jane, can you please post your question? I think Samuel was part of the team. Uh, they just ended the Global Youth uh, Peace Summit here in Istanbul. So Samuel, you have the floor. One minute, 30 seconds for your question. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to see Melina here. So uh, my question is, uh, now that the transformation has taken like over 30 years for them to be where they are right now, so what was the role of the youth at that time? What is the role of the youth at this time? 
and bearing in mind that uh, there was uh, the technology that was being used at that time and whatever that's being used is different. So how, how do you see the role of the youth and maybe how do you see the transformation where is where is going to be in the next maybe 10 or 30 years, just like you have taken 30 years to be where you are right now? Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. I'm very happy to meet you here again. We had an amazing time together uh, sharing a panel in Turkey, and now we have the opportunity to discuss here. So thank you so much for, for joining. About your question, yeah, I would say young people uh, have a big role in, in, transfer, in city transformation, especially from the case of my city. Um, uh, at the time when we used to be the most violent city of the world, it was pretty interesting how people, like the rest of the population that were, that were not the young people, used to see the youth as, the, as a threat, you know? They were the threat because they were the people that were part of the gangs or part of the guerrillas or even people doing micro, micro trafficking and so, so on and so forth. The, 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 situation, the situation changes uh, or changed when youth people started to empower them, themselves and show that where they were not the threat. They were the opportunity to make things different, right? And when they started to be part of this change, when they started to create their, communi their community movements, when they started to, to take the, the places that used, to be part, that used to be controlled by these illegal groups and, and so on, uh, the, the government and also the rest of the population understood that youth are not a threat. They are the opportunity of change, you know? So as I, as I showed in the presentation, uh, young people are the ones that can uh, do this kind of uh, activity such as the hip hop or the rap movement that there are in the stairs in Comuna 13, or they are the ones that sell this beautiful je uh, Colombian jewelry uh, there, you know? They are the ones that go and face the government and say, hey, we need uh, this or that to guarantee our, um, human rights so the role of young people it's vital uh, so if, if we want to think about uh, stopping urban violence and transform a city the young people have to be completely uh, like convinced that they are the ones that have to do the change you know that they cannot wait for anyone else to do that because they are the ones that have the let's say the principal uh, role uh, to ask for, for their needs, to ask for their rights, but also to transform their own communities. Okay, um, we have three questions before we go, and I think you, the others who are on board the platform have the questions. If you're just joining, joining us, our guest today on the program is Marena. She's, from, she's a Colombian, uh, a political scientist, and also the topic she's brushed so far or which has given up a robust and elusive explanation is urban violence and city transformation. Um, the, first, the next question is coming from Kevin. He says, in line with urban violence and city transformation, how can we use technology to manage disaster and risk because they are after effect? So that's the question from Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I guess. Right now, in the in the twenty first century, the technology has uh, also to play a big role in uh, in city transformation. And again, I think there are two things that we have to take into consideration, and it's that technology uh, can be a very very important uh, resource or mean to to control or not to control but to help development uh, and. Um, stability in a territory but it can also be a tool for control and it can um, how can we say it? like threat it represent a threat to other kind of rights such as privacy you know so again i, I would say that um, tra um, technology has to always always uh, be conceived as a tool for us to 
simplify uh, processes and face uh, threats or issues or challenges in a better way, you know, always uh, technology has to have in mind this um, or take into account the importance of uh, like the social uh, service that it, it, uh, that it uh, represents. But also, and at the same time, people have to be aware of what are the problems that it can represent, you know? And so they have to be always attentive uh, uh, about this uh, so they can know what are they sharing and what they can expect from this technology uh, in the context of a democracy, you know? Because otherwise we will live in this kind of panoptic uh, situation, you know? If some of you have read uh, 1984, uh, like uh, the use of, uh, like the undiscriminate use of uh, technology, uh, for example, because of, uh, with the excuse of uh, security, can represent a real threat for other kind of rights, such as privacy, such as uh, even freedom of movement, freedom of press, and so on. Okay, um, we got another question. I think the hand of Eno is up. Um, please, you have the floor to probably ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. My presentation was really, really uh, deep, and um, uh, I saw well uh, many similarities with with uh, the various communities that we have back home. Um, so I just have uh, two questions. With respect to uh, security, because I think one of the key uh, areas where in, in, term, in urban development is for people to feel safe in their homes, right? They can go to work, come back, feel safe. And so uh, I think for this, the police has a, a very a major role to play. And of course, um, we, you mentioned uh, drugs and some other uh, illicit transactions that were going on in the community. So, what what were the approaches that you used in order to uh, in order to fight these vices in the community? Now, we also know that police and the drug dealers are always friends. You know, they're always conniving right in, in the back. That's why they make so much money. So, in that case, or maybe in the case of Colombia or any other city that you know, what are the approaches that were used? To, to fight that. And secondly, uh, with respect to food industrial revolution, I think food industrial revolution, especially for developing countries, it's, it's an attractive um, way to develop cities, but the downside of it is usually ex lack of expertise and, and, and expenditure. So do you think that uh, local councils, like the way it works for us, local councils or communities should prioritize uh, the the spendings on food industrial revolutions to um, to urbanize or to make uh, cities uh, more urbanized. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enu, for both questions. Um, in the case of the first one, I would say that the key word it's a legitimacy. Mm, and it's a problem that we have, especially in weak states, uh, in, in states where institutions are stronger, maybe people don't have this problem of distrust in institutions. But in countries such as Colombia, it's pretty difficult that people feel safe, even if there is police in their, let's say, neighbor, you know, because there are a lot of um, dynamics of corruption, you know, even of partnership between these criminal groups and the police and so on. So, as I said, the key word is legitimacy because you have to work as, let's say, as the state, as the, um, as the public power, you have to work uh, to create a more transparent institutions that really represent the interests of the community, not about the, the criminal uh, groups, you know? But there is a, this, this is a big uh, chain of problems that are all related to the right to the city and also to the guarantee of uh, all the human rights in general. Because the problem is that, let's say, uh, if, the, if there is a police uh, officer that does not receive enough um, 
training or that his salary is not good enough, then he will find a better opportunities in, um, in illegal uh, dynamics, you know? Then uh, they will join this uh, illegal dynamic, of course. Uh, so you have, we have to work uh, on, yeah, especially as a weak states or states that are still uh, like developing countries, let's say, uh, in create, in build trust, in build trust in institutions, but also in guarantee that people that are part from the institutional uh, structures uh, receive enough uh, control from the population, but also uh, that they have all their needs solved so they don't have to be part of these dynamics. This is the first question. For the second one, it's uh, more tricky because we have to say that the, the, this is a problem of uh, the globalized world. I'm not saying that the globalization is itself a problem. Of course, it's not. But the thing is that nowadays we're part of a globalized world in which there are countries that are very, very strong in some things. And then there are some other countries that, they're, that they don't have the institutional uh, strength to face the same competition, you know? So, yes, I do think that uh, budgets, like institutional budgets, have to invest in this kind of uh, fourth rev uh, industrial revolution thing. But the thing is that since they are not strong enough, it's pretty difficult to prioritize this thing among other kind of needs, you know? You cannot say someone to be creative or to develop, I don't know, like IT tools if they don't have what to eat, you know, or if they don't have access to public services. So that's why I'm, that's why I said that public, um, sorry, that uh, transformations usually take time because uh, it's also a matter of a, like a state development. You have to build strong institutions. You have to create the, to build trust in these institutions. You have to guarantee um, all these human rights. And so then you can think about uh, investing in, in these kind of things. Again, the tricky thing here or the issue is that we are all facing at the face time these challenges that uh, represent technology and the fourth uh, industrial revolution. So for us as developing countries, uh, the thing is that we have to do all these processes all at the same time. We cannot avoid them, of course, because it's the dynamic of the world today. But yeah, I mean, maybe they have to prioritize, but uh, not, it's not just about that. They cannot hide that there's people that has not access to water, let's say, or that has not education. So if you are not accessing to education, how are you supposed to be creative and I don't know, like, a, you know, like, a, yeah, be creative or, or yeah, invent new tools for the, for this uh, digital area and so on. It's a, it's a big challenge, I would say. Okay, we are gradually going to the end of our program today. And I think I have the last question for you before we, we call it off for today. What is your last word or what are your last words to young people, community leaders and governments in areas where violence is, urban violence to be precise, is the order of the day? And how can they overcome urban violence by spearheading urban and city transformation? That's the last question for you. Thank you so much, Tekang. Um, my last word would say that real transformations occurred when there are jo when, where there is joint efforts. So uh, my word for young people is to be part of this effort, you know? To, to feel an, to feel as a, an active actor in these transformations, not just wait uh, wait for the institutions or wait for someone else to make the change because the real changes occur when people get involved in them and when they go and ask 
uh, the institutions, the state, and so on and so forth, uh, to guarantee this right to the city that involves all the things that uh, have to be guaranteed uh, in a urban context. So it's more about the not feeling the fear or not feeling disappointed by the context where they are, but understanding that understanding that urban areas are big places for opportunities, but they have to take an active role to change them. Okay, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. We thank our guests very much for this insight and if you just join us we were talking about urban violence and city transformation as our main topic and our guest on the program today was marina Duques diaz from colombia presently residing in paris thanks for joining us see you again in another edition in the next two weeks our pleasure for mariana for joining us on this special program organized by the Global Youth Connect Network chat platform for education and empowerment. Here, yeah, we educate, we empower, and we seek to engage and push forward a positive transformation in economics, in politics, in whatever domain held. You can name the rest. Bye-bye, and have a nice time. In Turkish, we say, Guru Shuz. Thank you.